George. <coughs> Take a little more of this. Come on, George. <coughs> May I use the phone? Go right ahead. How is George? Worse. I'm calling the doctor again. I'm afraid. How'd you call the doctor before? Hello? Uh, Dr. Stevens, quickly, please. This is Mr. Stark, 239 Adams, Hogan's apartment. What? Well, how soon can he get here? Oh, thank you. Is he coming? Dr. Stevens is on a maternity case, but his wife's already called another doctor. He should be here. Oh, George, you only told us what's been ailing him. We know it's his heart. Oh, once that ticker goes. A fine time for Dr. Stevens to go on a maternity case. Uh, I think I'll go and straighten out his bed. Nothing we can do. It's your deal, Craig. by Dr. Stevens. Oh, hurry, Doctor. It's a good thing you're here. The poor thing's been suffering something terrible. This is Dr. Miles. How do you do, Dr. Miles? How do you feel? Where's the pain? He can't speak, sir. He's a mute. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Please wait outside. Father, forgive me. Forgive me. He spoke. He spoke. Pulse is very low. He spoke to her, Mom. Did I? Why, it's a miracle. I can't believe it. He did speak. He he's said, Father. He's been rooming with us for over ten years, and, and he always wrote his answers on that little blackboard. And now he talked. Mr. Stark, did you hear? Yes, he spoke, but it was no miracle. It wasn't, huh? I heard him, didn't you, Mom? Clear as day. Father, forgive me, he said. Father, forgive me. George was not a mute. He just didn't speak. For years, he's never uttered a word. Why would a man do such a thing? I don't believe it. A man keeping his mouth shut for years? No, sir. George's story was very strange, almost beyond belief. His real name was not George Turner. <laughs> it all began in Hungary many years ago in the little province of Eridi, not far from Budapest. The baron of this province owned most of the land there. But when he discovered there was oil on the property, he kept the discovery a secret. And he immediately began to negotiate through various pretenses for the purchase of all the neighboring farms. Good evening, Baron. Good evening, honey. Come over here. Cigarette? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, have a drink. Honey, <laughs> No, I don't drink, Baron. I don't. Well, honey, we have been neighbors for years. But yet, in reality, we are not. But why? This land of yours, Holly. Those acres which you rented to these people. I don't want them near me. I hear you are selling the land to them, hmm? No, it's a good price they offer me. Holly, look, you have no agreements. Getting rid of them would mean all crops would belong to you. I'm not a farmer. The crops will be ruined. I'll help you. My men will bring it in. In fact, I might even buy your property if you still want to sell it. Baron, I didn't know. I didn't know you wanted my property. Why, you can have anything you want, any. Very simple, but now you have to excuse me. My niece is waiting. Darinka! Come in, Darinka, and don't forget what I told you. Oh, huh? oh, oh, yeah. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. It's about your buying part of my land. I heard you made the same lead with Hornish. Yes, I'm acquiring several parcels of land. It has to wait until after election time, you understand? Let me come to an agreement. Oh, yes, yes, Baron. The Baron met with no opposition to his deals, except for one. And although Horney wanted to sell his land to the Baron, he had it leased out at the time, and the tenants who'd been there for generations refused to move. Well, a short time later, an incident occurred in this province. A young girl mysteriously disappeared and not being found, her case was put into the unsolved files. Well, 
the Baron called up one of his political lackey, Budapest. And acting on the Baron's orders, this lackey took over and went to the local authorities. Yes, sir? State Attorney Stark? No, no. Mr. Stark isn't here just now. I'm his assistant. Uh, what can I do for you? How do you do? I'm Kuhlman Ballard, Special Investigator of Budapest. Here are my credentials. Oh, pleased to meet you. My name is Erno Miller. But our office has already made a report of the missing on Atomashi. That's exactly why I am here. You see, my very good friend, Baron Aradey, has taken a personal interest in the question of why you gentlemen have been unable to find the murderer of this girl. You see, she happened to have been a maid for one of the Baron's neighbors. Murderer? But uh, my superior, Mr. Stark... Of course, Stark, the uh, Baron has uh, told me enough to give me the information that this girl simply could not have vanished into thin air just like that. Well, you may have something there, Mr. Ballard. Of course, I, uh, I realize that you gentlemen from the provinces have a limited knowledge of criminal investigation. Uh, Mr. Ballard, this is uh, confidential. You see, I'm uh, sort of handicapped by my superior's policies. He's uh, a stickler. Facts, rules, abstract justice. <laughs> but uh, now that you're here, I'm sure I can be of great service to you. And uh, will you please tell Baron Aradey I am at his disposal? Hmm, splendid. We hope to call on your services. Now I shall uh, get a room at the inn. I want you to prepare an office for me. And please tell Mr. Stark that I have taken entire charge of the investigation. Balog's first orders were to arrest Horney's tenants. I want you to sign this confession right now. But, sir, there is nothing I could possibly confess. I haven't done a thing, not a thing. None of you has anything to confess. You all lie right into my face. You killed Anna Tamashi. Put them in chains, lock them up. But listen, just, just another word, listen. Order of orders. No one is allowed At last, the trial against the tenants began. This case was brought to the attention of a brilliant lawyer and humanitarian who offered to defend the accused. This is the press, Mr. Nemish. Yes. All right, Mr. Schwartz. Sneak in. But you must leave as soon as the judges come in. Mr. Fisher. Mrs. Schwartz, don't worry. It'll be all right. Shot. I haven't seen my wife for two months. Please, Mr. Papa. Samuel. My boy. <laughs> Now you must go. Everybody rise! Attorney, will you read the indictment? Members of the Royal Court, on August 3rd, 14-year-old Anna Tamashi disappeared mysteriously. She was last seen when she called at Joseph Schwartz barn. Mr. Coloman Balog, assigned to this case as special investigator, discovered that the missing girl was present during a violent argument between Farmer Schwartz and his landlord, Mr. Horney. The argument between these two men climaxed with Schwartz's attempt upon the life of Mr. Horney. The contention of the state is that Anna was done away with because she was a potential witness against Schwartz, as well as against the other accused who were on the scene and thereby involved. The indictment charges the defendants with the murder of Anna Tamashi. Thank you, Mr. State Attorney. Your Honor, gentlemen, I move for an immediate dismissal. There's no sound basis for this case. There's not the slightest evidence. The defendants even saw the missing girl on the day of her disappearance. Prosecution cannot produce the body of the allegedly murdered girl. Who knows but what at this very moment she may be living peacefully, perhaps romantically, a few miles from here. Mr. Nemes, you come from Budapest, huh? Yes, why? One can easily see that you live in the uh, sophisticated atmosphere of a big city and do not know the pure nature of a country girl. Baron Aradey, 
I'm sure no one will dispute the fact that you are an authority on virtue. Order, gentlemen. Uh, will the court please call the witnesses? Gustav Horney. Gustav Horney, 51, landowner. Mr. Horney, tell us what happened on the evening you called at Mr. Schwartz's house. Well, you see, my wife, she didn't want me to lease our land out any longer, and so Mr. I... Mr. Horney! How long has Schwartz been on your land? I only see his father leased the land to my father. That must have been about uh, 45 years ago. Mr. Horney, tell us what happened the evening you called at Mr. Schwartz's house. Well, you see, my wife, she told me to go and see Schwartz and tell him about our decision. And uh, later, she talked to the other tenants. Well, <coughs> Schwartz isn't very easy to handle, you know. But I went just the same. Have you had any previous clashes with Schwartz? Uh -huh, no, I always kept out of his way. Well, that night I found Schwartz in his barn. When I told him he had to leave, he went for my throat. He almost killed me. That is not true! It Hurry. is, it is. Why, he was choking me. He, he almost killed me. You told me to pack and leave at the end of the month, just before harvest. I have to take care of my family during the winter. Quiet. Schwartz was provoked, Your Honor, understandably so. But where is the proof that he wanted to kill Horney? I picked up a pitchfork, and he said, I see you dead before I leave this land. Why, my wife would be a widow if it wasn't for poor Anna. Why? She just came in there. That's why he happened to look up, and that gave me a chance to dodge and run out the barn. I ran for my way. As I whipped up my horses, I heard a scream from the barn. When I finally got home, all in cold sweat and all the travel, I told my wife, that Schwartz almost killed me, and that Anna had seen it, she said, Anna is your witness. When she gets home, take her to the police with you. What happened then? Well, Anna didn't get home. So we began to worry. Then we put two and two together. And then we began to suspect what actually happened to poor Anna. Your Honor, the defense insists the missing girl never came to the barn. Is there anything else you can tell us about this case? Well, uh, that's all, Your Honor. You may go. If I may, Mr. State Attorney. Certainly. It's quite clear, Your Honor, that a meeting of the defendants took place in the home of Schwartz, where it was decided to use violence on the landlord so they could stay on the land. Gathering is quite harmless, Your Honor. The question remains, was Anna Tamashi really present at the scene? Can there be any doubt? The testimony of the landlord can hardly be considered reliable when he had such a stake in getting rid of his tenants. Call your next witness. Mrs. Giuliani. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Uh, you are Mrs. Giuliana Horney? Tell us what you know about this case. Well, to start with, Anna was like a child to me. I quite forgot she was my servant. Were you actually related to the murdered? Missing. Please answer the question. My father... God rest his soul, married Anna's grandmother. God rest her soul. But apart from any blood bonds, Anna was like a daughter to me. And now she's gone. Murdered, that's what she was. How do you know that? It's as sure as night follows day. I sent Anna to Eckelmeyer's to get some paint. I keep my house neat as a pin. Now, when did Anna leave the house to get the paint? At seven o'clock, right after supper. She wouldn't even wait for the dumplings. I told her to come home quick. To get on with the painting? Because it was getting dark. She came back in no time, but with the wrong paint. When was that? At 7.30. And you sent her back to get the right paint? I knew she wouldn't sleep if I hadn't. she hadn't gone back. And you sent her back this time in spite of the growing darkness. She insisted on finishing the painting that night. Did she like working that much? For 50 coppers a week. She cleaned the house, made the beds, washed the dishes, did the laundry, fed the animals, milked the cow, and you saw to it that she lacked no ability to enjoy herself. What happened after the girl left the house the second time? I waited for her. When my husband came home and told me he saw her at... at Sch Schwartz's barn, I... I was frightened. So I rushed to her mother, hoping she would get there. But I couldn't find her anywhere. My poor husband had to run for his life. And Anna was there, too, and saw it. That's why they killed her. Keep them in jail, Your Honor. Mrs. Horney. 
Any further questions, Mr. Stark? Mr. Nemish? No. You may go. Told the witnesses have been led to believe by certain parties that it is not unlawful to break an oath. Nonsense. As special investigator for this case, I assume that Mr. Nemish is referring to me. I had bigger game in mind. That shall not remain unanswered, Mr. Nemish. Unfortunately, I have to deliver a speech in Parliament. I have to catch a train. Therefore, I ask your honors to be heard at once. Considering the pressing nature of Baron Hardy's official duties, the court has decided to waive procedure. Thank you. Your honors, ever since the murder of Anna Tamashi... I object, your honor. There's no proof of murder. Very well, then, Mr. Nemesh. Ever since the disappearance of Anna Tamashi, ever since my own good, kind neighbors came to me, their suspicions growing ever stronger and stronger. Ever since this tragic, shattered ghost that was once Anna's happy mother came to me and begged me with tears and eyes for justice. And then, and my good friend, the special investigator, presented to me fact after fact of damning evidence. Then I knew, beyond any possible shadow of doubt, that here was the most dreadful murder ever committed in cold blood. Baron, have you any material evidence to offer concerning this case? Nothing beyond the uh, conclusive findings of the special investigator. Any further questions? What for? Your Honor, this witness has no real evidence to offer. Thank you, Your Honor. Call your next witness. Uh, will your honor please call witness uh, Andreas Molnar? Molnar. Perhaps. Andreas Molnar, age 52. Labor on Baron Arida's estate. May I, your honor? Proceed, Mr. Investigator. Molnar. You had an unusual experience the night that Anna disappeared. Yeah, yes. Uh, tell us in detail what you saw. I saw Anna dead with a big cut in her throat, right across here. Tell me. What exactly did you see? Those five men were digging. Digging? Where was this? In the backyard of Schwartz's house. I knew what they were digging from what I heard at the inn. What did you hear at the inn? What everybody else did. Mr. Horney come in and said, I bet my last copper those five men killed Anna in Schwartz's barn because she was a witness for me. And that makes you sure they were digging a grave for Anna? Yes. Didn't the prosecution investigate Molnar's story and dig up the body? Naturally, we investigated Molnar's story and uh, we found evidence of uh, freshly dug earth behind the barn. But the defendants must have uh, gotten wind that we were on their trail, so they dug up the body and buried it elsewhere. You admit you let these defendants get the best of you? Why, Mr. Bellow? Any further questions? No. No, Your Honor. Witness dismissed. Your Honor, I request that the missing girl's mother be called Mrs. Maria Tomashe. Maria Tomashe. Maria Tamashi, widow. Profession, laundress. Tell us what happened on August 3rd. What happened? With the permission of the court. All right. Mr. Investigator, you may question the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Did your daughter Anna come to see you on August 3rd? Yes. Mrs. Tamashi, did you ask your daughter Anna to go to the Schwartz's? Gentlemen. I object to the way these leading questions are put to the witness. In view of the state of mind and emotions of the mother, I am forced to get her testimony by this simple method. You may continue. You asked your daughter Anna to stop off at the Schwartz's 
and tell them that you were to be unable to come and help Mrs. Schwartz the next day. Yes. And your daughter was 14 when she disappeared? Yes, 14. How old was she when you first sent her out to work? 11. You mean to say your daughter was only 11 years old when she first started to work? I worked when I was eight. Did she ever complain that Mrs. Horney had treated her badly? Mrs. Horney has clearly stated her relationship with the missing girl. You've heard Mrs. Horney state that she considered the missing girl as her daughter. When did you first learn that your daughter had disappeared? I don't know. Mrs. Tamashi, what did you tell me you knew happened to your daughter? I know was killed. How do you happen to know that? I saw it. You mean to say you were present when your daughter was killed? She had her head cut off. I saw it in my dream. Gentlemen, for the record and for your particular attention, please note that this witness has just testified under oath that she saw her daughter killed in a dream. Any further questions? No. No questions. Mrs. Tomashe, that is all. Doctor, will you help the witness, please? <laughs> Call your next witness. Call her Thomasy. Clara Thomasy, age 17, domestic servant. Calm yourself, my child. When and where did you see your sister last, Clara? It was in my mother's house. I went to see her because she was sick. What was Anna wearing? Her dress. What dress? The only one she had. What did you talk about? She told me that Mother said for her to stop off at Schwartz to say she couldn't go to work the next day because she was sick. What time was it when your sister left? About half past seven in the evening. Did she have anything else to say to you? She told me she was going to buy a new dress for Sunday and asked me to meet her in front of the inn. She wanted me to help her pick it out. When your sister left, did she not go directly to the Schwartzes? Yes, she did. I object, Your Honor. There's no proof that the missing girl actually went there. Mr. Horney has testified that he has seen Anna at the Schwartzes. Her mother has stated that she sent her there, and this witness has verified that. How much proof does the defense require? Uh, any questions? No questions. Gentlemen? No questions. None. That is all, my child. You may go. Call your next witness. Margaret Darosh. Margaret Darosh, age 17. You are the daughter of Dr. Darosh? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Miss Darosh, uh, you do not live far from the Schwartzes. Not far. Uh, tell us what you particularly noticed on the evening of August 3rd. I was about to close the shutters of my room when I heard a distant scream. And uh, where did that scream come from? From the direction of Schwartz's barn. Mm -hmm. What else did you notice? The scream was followed by a choke crying. Miss Darosh, couldn't it have been an animal? No, it was a girl. Do you have that, gentlemen? I want the records to show that Miss Margaret Darosh, on the evening of August 3rd, heard a girl crying, screaming, choking, and that these sounds came from the direction of the Schwartz farm. Just how far is Schwartz's barn from your home? About a five-minute walk. It's too vague, Miss Darosh. Would you say it was half a mile? Not quite. You mean you could distinguish clearly the cry of a girl from that far away? I found out later I was correct. How so? Someone else heard it, too, and told me. Who told you? Mr. Investigator, it would be advisable for you to produce the witness for the prosecution. Mr. Ballog, can you produce this witness? I think I can produce the witness to confirm Miss Darrow's statement with the court's permission. Is young Samuel Schwartz out here? Me? Uh, 
happen. Samuel, take off your hat. What is he doing here? You are the son of Joseph Schwartz? Yes. How old are you, Samuel? I was 14 on the 24th of June. Samuel, did you not tell Daroche that you heard a girl scream on August 3rd? No. No, I didn't. Is that your answer? Remember, you want the truth. I object, Your Honor. This boy has been questioned time and time again. His various testimonies are in the record. Very well, then. Ms. Daroche, according to this young man's testimony, it is you who have lied. You're under oath and can be punished. Miss Margaret never lies. All I told her was that I, I saw Anna in the barn. Samuel, they're using this girl to trap you. Don't lie. My son is not lying. It's true. Anna did come to the barn while the landlord was there. Joseph! What are you saying? You never told us that. Why did you conceal that from your attorneys? Schwartz, did you commit this crime? I haven't committed any crime. As for the others, they didn't even see the girl. Here it is. This man has as good as confessed, but he is trying to cover up for the others. Schwartz, tell me here and now, why did you conceal the fact that Anna did come to the barn? I took one look at my sick wife, and I was afraid to see it. Samuel, we now know that Anna was in the barn. Now, why not admit that you actually heard the girl scream, as Miss Darrow said? But I didn't hear it. If you did, I don't ever want to see you again. Well, Mr. Ballog, you can't sway this boy to lie in spite of the pressure that's been brought to bear on him, his adolescence, and all your charms, Miss Darrow. Gentlemen. Police sergeant reports the finding of a female corpse in the river, which may well have some connection with this case. What makes you think that this corpse has any connection with Anna Tomashi? It's the dress, sir. It answers the description we have in our police records. Besides, we have no report of any other girl missing hereabouts. Where is the body? Outside. We brought it in the cart. Your Honor, the mother of the missing girl is in the witness room. I request the court's permission to have her look at the body immediately for identification. Granted. Constable. Would you conduct Miss Tamashi to the car? And Mr. Miller, would you please go along? Yes. I'd like to have my associate, Advocate Fisher, view the body with them. Granted. Who are these men? The two rascals who found the body. What are your names? I am Herman. And you? My name is Joseph Martin. How and where did you find the body? Well, when we were making for shore on our raft, I saw something stuck in the weeds. So I took one of our long oars and tried to get it loose. When we saw it was a dead woman, Martin wanted me to throw the body back. But I was afraid. Afraid somebody might be watching. So I made him help me, and we dragged the body out and put it on the grass. Martin ran for the police, and I stayed with the body. Gentlemen! Gentlemen, the body of that girl shows no mutilation whatsoever. There is no cut on the neck of that girl. No mutilation. Sergeant, take them away. Quickly. <laughs> Mrs. Tamashi, was that your daughter? Yes. But poor Anna, my child. Is there a dress in her dress? Your Honor, the mother has positively identified the body as that of her missing daughter, Anna. It's been put on record that the murdered girl was killed with a cut across the throat. Precisely. Therefore, gentlemen, this that cannot possibly be the corpse of the girl we are looking for. Isn't it possible, Mr. Ballog, that your witness, Molnar, has lied? Your Honor. This mother's positive identification speaks for itself. Your Honor, Mrs. Tamashi is obviously demented. My superior, Mr. Sark, has formed his own conclusion.
The state could not accept her identification as positive. She's not of sound mind. This whole procedure must be stricken from the record. The body has been identified by a mother and the dress... It's generally known that Mrs. Thomasy has accepted the sight and presence of any girl as that of her own daughter. It's understandable what she would have said when she saw the body of a girl clad in a dress like the one her murdered daughter wore. Gentlemen of the prosecution, is this another maneuver of yours to further persecute these innocent men? I move that we recess immediately. The investigation will discredit Don't any and the charge of murder against these defendants has collapsed like a prick balloon. I move that we absolve these men of the charges as they appear in the indictment. Surely more concrete evidence, more positive assurance to satisfy our courts are in order. Excuse me, gentlemen. A verdict rendered in haste would be rash and ill-considered. In view of the astonishing events and developments that we have witnessed, the court calls for time so that both the defense and the prosecution might have an opportunity to confirm their respective contentions. Court adjourned. My sympathies and convictions with Nemish and the defense. Your members of the royal court, as this trial resumes, I find it necessary to tender my resignation with profound regret and with the most vigorous protest against what has become a travesty of justice. But one thing, I will use all of my influence to prevent any further use of your service in public office. Baron Arity, I knew that you would say just that. I realize that my resignation will be hoped by him and his party. However, let me hasten to add, were it not for the legal impossibilities which bar me, I would be seated at that table with the defense. Mr. Stark, this is very irregular. Your resignation will have to be reported to the Ministry of Justice. I submit that you do so without delay. Mr. Miller, will you assume the duties of the prosecution? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Stark, you have my deepest respect. God be with you. Good luck, Mr. Nemish. Your Honor, more than a month has elapsed since the positive identification of Anna Tamashi's body by her mother. Our laws prescribe a quick execution of the guilty, not a slow killing of the innocent. Innocent? The defense is asking for the acquittal of these killers. I own material. Your Honors, here is the evidence of an incredible conspiracy to thwart justice. If the investigator has any new evidence, I demand that it be produced here in the flesh, not by means of these documents. I was trying to save Your Honors time. However, we anticipated that counsel for the defense would prove obstinate. So we have our witnesses right here. May I suggest that we first call Dr. Darrow, Shabtanava, general practitioner? If any new witnesses are to be called, I demand that we pick up where we left off. The defense would like to have Mrs. Maria Tamashi repeat her last statement. I would like you to decide for yourself, Mr. Nemish, if you wish to have her called. In fact, that's why we're calling on Dr. Darrow. Call Dr. Darrow. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Dr. Derosh, you are the only resident physician of Tarnabar, and uh, I assume your practice embraces the entire community. It does. Uh, tell us what happened to Mrs. Tamashe. She is uh, suffering from delusions and is thoroughly incompetent. She is now uh, confined to a mental institution which I recommended. Just when did you find her to be mentally ill? Since the very day her daughter dis... It's obvious, Your Honor, only too obvious. But this woman was declared to be insane the moment she made the most damaging statement to the prosecution, when she identified the body as that of her missing daughter. No one could identify that body. It had been decomposed. It must have been in the water at least six or seven months. Not only did the mother identify her daughter, but the dress of Anna as well. Oh, yes, the dress. I am prepared for that, too. But now, can anyone doubt the integrity of our esteemed physician? Just how does the doctor justify his opinion? I wish to add uh, that Anna was only 14 years old while his body was unquestionably that of a girl uh, 18 years old. There are certain uh, anatomical facts that do not uh, melt away in water, Mr. Lynch. With all due respect for Dr. Darash as a general practitioner, I question whether he's qualified to voice such a definite opinion. May I call county physician Dr. Georges Samosh for corroboration? Dr. Samosh. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Dr. Darash. Dr. Samosh, your colleague has stated that the corpse which was found in the Tarnabar River was not that of Anna Tomashi. 
Do you share his opinion? I do. Doctor, did you know the missing anatomy? Not personally. You never saw her, and yet you say this body cannot be hers. I know my medicine as well as you know your law. There is no question that the dead girl had ever done any hard physical work. Furthermore, I should judge the corpse to be that of a woman in her 20s, fully matured. Your colleague has just told us the body was that of an 18-year-old girl. Uh, if my colleague estimates 20 years, I naturally bow to his superior knowledge. When a corpse has been in the water for three or four months, it's really quite difficult to establish the exact age. The anatomical... You gentlemen woman... don't agree here, either. I want to emphasize that Dr. Samosh has stated that the body was that of a person belonging to the better classes, and that, in his opinion, the body was also that of a mature woman. <laughs> Pick the best from each witness and discard the contradictions. A very convenient method. Differences? How can a mother's sure knowledge be dismissed by any professional assumption? Uh, any further questions? No, no questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Now I see what has taken place during this adjournment. But gentlemen, the bodies of young ladies don't float up and down the river. Whose body is it if not anatomishes? Does it not occur to Mr. Nemesh that the body might have been stolen by an accomplice from the Mark and Budapest or from the cemetery? Baron Arity. Your personal interest in this case needs to be exposed. Gentlemen. You'll hear the rest of it, Baron. I don't put up with slender. Whatever these people have accumulated, whatever seeds they've sown by their sweat and labor will be picked up for a song. What loot? Piling for these murderers. On the record. My colleague, Mr. Carl Nemish, has volunteered his services in this case without any compensation whatsoever. Order, gentlemen. This is not getting us anywhere. I restrain you from any further disturbance of this sort. Mr. Miller, will you continue? I propose, Your Honor, that the state be allowed to call the rest of the witnesses. Granted. Constable, call Rassman, Herman, and Martin. What is the charge against these men? Accomplices in the crime. They, too. Will you please tell the court the events that led up to your arrest? I confess to the investigator. You want your confession to be read? Yes. One evening, during the middle of June of this year, I don't remember the date exactly, a woman dressed in brown and carrying a small parcel under her arm offered to give us a hundred gulden if we would carry out her instructions. She pointed to some bushes on the other side of the river and said that we would find a female corpse hidden under a blanket. In the parcel were some torn clothes which we were to put on the girl. We were to tie the body under our raft where nobody could see it, float it downstream as far as Otarnavar, and then pretend we had just found it in the river. Your Honor, are we expected to believe this, this nightmare? this work of fiction. Just who is this woman in brown? What's her name? You, uh, you took the clothes from the woman in brown and dressed the strange corpse, and then went to the place she told you to and acted as if you just found the body? The defense wants proof. Can you produce this witness, Mr. Barlow? Uh, no, unfortunately, we have been unable to produce the woman in brown. Apparently, she's the only one you've overlooked. Your Honor, have I your permission to examine those records? Thank you. Herman, just how often did Mr. Ballog cross-examine you during your imprisonment? Answer the question. I don't remember. Once a week? Every day? Sunday, too? Did he wake you up at night? To drag these lines out of you, he... I protest against this continuous attack on an official carrying out his duty. Baron Araby, please. Has the counsel for the defense any proof that these confessions were obtained from the witnesses by force? Unfortunately, no, Your Honor. Until this woman can be produced here in court, I demand in the interest of justice that this case be adjourned. I cannot favor any further loss of time in this trial. Will the investigator use every means in his power to bring this woman into court? Certainly, Your Honor. The court will proceed with the evidence. Any further questions? No questions. No questions. Take them away.
I would like to enter a strong complaint for the record. We of the defense have been unable to contact either the defendants or the witnesses during this recess. We haven't even been able to reach young Samuel Schwartz, who's been placed in the care of the state. Is it the practice of the prosecution to hold witnesses incommunicado? Very well, Mr. Nemish. Young Samuel Schwartz is here now in my office. You wish to call him? I most certainly do. With permission of the court. Please call Samuel Schwartz. Mr. Bell. Do you explain why you kept this boy isolated? We had good reason to keep him in the care of the state. You see, uh, one never knows what might happen to this boy. He could have been intimidated. <laughs> Look at my boy. Your Honor. Samuel Schwartz is here in the capacity of a witness for the state. The court must warn Samuel that the law cannot force him to testify against his father. Oh, there's no need for that, Your Honor. You have before you his sworn statement, which the prosecution would like to have read. Mr. Investigator, will you read this statement, please? This is the sworn statement of Samuel Schwartz, as given to me, and I quote, On the evening of August 3rd, just before 8 o'clock, I saw Anna Tomashi enter my father's barn. Our landlord, Mr. Horney, and my father had a heated argument. My father ran after him with a pitchfork. I heard Anna's voice saying, Schwartz will kill him. Call the police. Then I heard a commotion. I looked through the keyhole. There was only one lantern lit inside the barn, so I could not distinguish who said, she's a witness for the landlord. We will all be in trouble. I could see another one take this sickle he cornered Anna and cut her throat, and I saw the blood flow down her neck. She was dead. Son, did you see that? Samuel, uh, you will repeat here now. Papa wasn't there when the girl was killed. That is correct. You testified that your father was outside chasing Mr. Horney while the others committed the murder. Your Honor, I will prepare a motion to remove Schwartz's name from the indictment for murder. However, we will detain him temporarily for complicity in the crime. The court's permission, I'd like to question the witness. Granted. Samuel, we've just heard your sworn statement. First, let me say you look quite different now. You're not the same boy who was here before. You've changed. Tell me, Samuel, just what has been done to you? How did this all come about? I object. You object to my questioning the witness? Now, Samuel, isn't it true that you were a guest at the Baron's castle? You and Miss Darosh were escorted there by Mr. Ballard. Nothing wrong with being nice to a poor boy. And as you left there, it was in these fine new clothes you're wearing now. I didn't get them there. The tailor came to me. And the barber, too. And weren't you taken for jaunt to Budapest in the Baron's carriage? And didn't the young lady accompany you, Miss Margaret Darosh? The defense seems to have a great deal of information, although it claims to have been denied access to this young man. This is one time the defense has taken the liberty of putting two and two together. And as for this record, there it is, gentlemen, just a blank piece of paper. You thought it was clever by such a compromise. To say the father was out chasing the landlord at the actual time the killing took place. That gentleman is a dead giveaway, a bad piece of construction. Your assumptions are insulting and unfounded, Mr. Nemish. They are another attack on the state's integrity. Your Honor, I request the court's permission for this father to speak to his own son. Thank you, Your Honor. Samuel, go to your father. The others couldn't have killed Anna. The only one who saw the girl was I, so if you say a murder was committed in our barn, you are only accusing your father. But, Papa, you didn't kill her. Of course I didn't. And neither did they. Look at your father. See, I haven't told the truth. He couldn't have changed that way by himself. You have done this to him. You have made him a... A rotten traitor, a, a dreadful slaughter, you! Keep your clothes, Mr. 
man is insane. Oh, Constable, will you take this boy back to my office, please? Your Honor, we of the defense could not have anticipated the unprincipled tactics of the prosecution. Consequently, we've been forced to improvise our defense from moment to moment. This case has become both tragic and ridiculous. The nimbly hope of helping the accused was to discredit the testimony of every witness called by Ballard. Professor Barr from the University of Budapest readily agreed to testify. Here, gentlemen, is the River Conover. You will observe the winding course of the river down to the old village of O'Conover. Here is the town of Conover. Considering the current, the time of the year, the whirlpools and other handicaps, I would estimate that the corpse needed four to six weeks to cover this stretch. It uh, is not easy to estimate with accuracy how long a corpse has been lying in the water. However, I can assert with authority that it could not have been less than four weeks, nor more than six weeks. Dr. Darosh estimates the body was in the water six or seven months, while Dr. Samosh asserts it was only three or four months. <laughs> Dr. Samosh attended my lectures for years, but I cannot guarantee that he absorbed them. As for Dr. Darosh, he is unknown to me. You gentlemen agree with the professor? No, I do not. No, the discrepancy is rather large. Then in your opinion, professor, these two experts are both mistaken. There is no doubt. <laughs> uh, you may laugh, gentlemen, but that does not conceal your professional blunders. I am no longer your pupil, Professor. And I am free to laugh at obsolete analyses. Professor Burr, did you estimate the approximate age of the corpse? Around 50. That's ridiculous. This was a fully matured woman. I have known girls to be fully matured at the age of 12. Water does many things, but it does not change people's ages. It will make any skin soft and smooth. Even the callous feet of a girl who went barefoot all her life. Then there's no proof as to what class this girl belonged to. Professor Burr, you studied the sworn statements of the two ratsmen. What is your opinion of their testimony? It is improbable that they could have transported the body, as they say, without attracting the attention of other ratsmen. A body in such a state of decomposition would have slowly spread a very strong odor. Professor Barr, uh, you are employed at the University of Budapest? I am. Lately, your appearances in court have been largely in behalf of an insurance company, the Hungarian... Insurance companies frequently need expert medical analyses. I wish to point out to the court that the president of the Hungarian Alliance has been very much interested in this case. Is it not too obvious that... That has nothing to do with my opinion as an expert. Oh, no, of course not, Professor. Nothing whatsoever. Your Honor, this is shameful. One of our country's foremost scientists subjected to this slander. Do not uh, disturb yourself, Mr. Nemish. These gentlemen are not in a position to change my views or to affect my personal integrity. Have the medical experts any further statements they would care to make? None. None. In view of the circumstances, none. Thank you, thank you, Professor Burr. And I'm very sorry. Your Honors, these contradictions mean nothing. According to two eyewitnesses, Samuel Schwartz and Molnar, Anna Tomashi was killed with a sickle. Her throat was cut. Mr. Prosecutor, it's exactly what we intend to disprove. Therefore, I demand the state produce this woman in brown. Unfortunately, we have been unable to find the woman in brown. Either this witness is in hiding or has mysteriously vanished. But if the mysterious woman were produced, she would only serve to reinforce the case for us, the prosecution. So why delay any longer? Your Honor, since the state has failed to produce this witness, I promise to bring her here. Defense has promised to produce a witness who could not be found by the state. This is another forgery in the network of lies which has been exhibited. A most ingenious house of cards, topped by that decked out in Anna's clothes. 
of the so-called medical expert coming down from the capital city, trying to throw the dust of his pretended learning in your eyes. While on the other hand, the state has offered many witnesses to testify in an unpretentious way as simple, well-meaning people do. Mr. Prosecutor, I must interrupt and I request the court's attention. We have here a new witness who awaits immediate examination. You are too late, Mr. Nemish. This case is not closed, Mr. Prosecutor. Your Honor, it's important this woman be heard at once. I insist that you insist. I shall be forced to resign, Your Honor, together with my colleague with the defense at this last hour if our motion is rejected. <laughs> Let them resign. The court does not wish to deprive the defendants of the benefit of counsel. Bring the witness in, Mr. Fisher. Your name? Irene Pater. Where are you from? Budapest. What connection has this woman with the case? If I were given the chance, I'd bring out my point. I understand from the investigator that this woman has been jailed for drunkenness and disorderly conduct in the last ten days. But State Attorney Miller has just said that you were uh, jailed on various counts. Is that true? Yes. And where were you imprisoned? Right here. Women's section, second floor, cell number three. What did you learn in prison that might concern this case? There was a woman in the cell next to mine who was being given sedatives to keep her quiet. Her name is Mrs. Ethel Mihaly from a village nearby. How do you associate that person with the case? She kept repeating that she wanted to come to court to testify. Your Honor, this witness knows what she's saying. No decent person could possibly believe a woman of this sort. Mr. Ballack, you've said too much. I demand an immediate apology. My dear colleague, these gentlemen cannot possibly know that this lady happens to be your wife. Mr. Nemish, I demand an explanation. Your Honor, the wife of my associate submitted to this experiment pretending to be drunk and disorderly. You see, we simply had to get someone inside that prison to find out what was being kept so secret. Your Honor, I demand that Mrs. Ethel Mealy be produced here at once to testify. This woman wants to be heard and should be heard. Thank you. Will the court please sign this order to produce this witness now? This is all a pack of lies! Madam Fisher, I thank you. I would like to have the state witness, young Samuel Schwartz, recall. Constable, call in. Samuel Schwartz. Samuel, on December 5th, you described in detail the actual murder of Anna Tamashe. I want to ask you just one question, and I don't want anyone to answer it for you. Just how did you see the actual killing of Anna? I... I saw it through the keyhole. Thank you, Samuel. That will be all. You may go now. Your Honor, you've heard the witness repeat that he witnessed the crime through a keyhole in the barn door. Gentlemen, there's only one door in that barn, and there's nothing in that door that faintly resembles a keyhole. That's a lie. Mr. Schwartz, you've stated you built that barn yourself. Was there a keyhole in that door? No. There was no keyhole. Your Honor, we now have proof that young Samuel Schwartz has been lying. Come here, Mrs. Mealy. Step right up. Gentlemen, please note the brown dress. Mrs. Mealy, where are you from? Oh, Tanabar. And when were you arrested? On December 8th. What has this to do with the case? Please don't be cross with me, mister. They all shouted at me. But it was Dr. Barroza who first told me the story. What story? They were looking for a woman in this dress from Otanabar. A woman who had given a package to two raptsmen. The doctor told me to keep my brown dress on and to report to the investigator. When I came, he told me I had no business coming to him without a summons. And that man arrested me. That's a lie. Mrs. Mealy, did you know the two ratsmen, Herman and Martin? Yes. And did you give them a hundred gulden? When did I ever have a hundred gulden? Did you give these two men a package containing a woman's clothes? A woman's clothes? Oh, no. They give me their clothes to men for a few coppers every time they go up the river. Then I meet them on the shore on their way back. Exactly what did you give them last time? A jacket, 
And two shirts. Then it's not true you gave them a package containing anything belonging to the missing Anna Tamashi. No! Gentlemen, the woman in brown has just testified that she did not give any of Anna's clothes to the two ratsmen. Thank you, Mrs. Mihaly. You are no longer in custody. You are free to go anytime you choose. Constable. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I shall forgo the pleasure of discrediting your two ratsmen and bringing to light the methods used by the state to procure all their testimonies. Let me recall the absurd testimony of the grieving mother who dreamed she saw her daughter slaughtered by these defendants. That dream, gentlemen, we've discovered was inspired by a gypsy woman to read the cards for this poor woman and make her believe the preposterous story which ignited the entire case against these defendants. And when she testified against you, you took this simple, gullible woman, declared her to be incompetent, insane. My mother isn't crazy. She'll die. It will be my fault, too. Why? Why will it be your fault? I could have saved Anna. I saw her a second time that night. I met her in front of the inn. She came running along the street. She was crying and sobbing. Why was she crying? Why? She did not get the money for the new dress from Mrs. Horney. Because she got the wrong paint. And Mrs. Horney beat her. Do you remember what time it was? Yes. It was the time we planned to meet. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Yes. In the testimony of young Samuel Schwartz, he stated he saw Anna Tamashi murdered in his father's barn at exactly eight o'clock. State she saw her sister alive and well and in the village at precisely that same hour. Nobody killed her. Anna ran for the river. And I saw her jump over the bridge. Why didn't you go over help? I was always jealous of her. She had that appointment for Sunday. What appointment? I can't tell, but she wanted that dress to look more beautiful. You must tell us, my dear, you must. I can't, I can't. Did someone warn you not to tell us? Who warned you not to tell us? It was the investigator. That's not true! Yes, it is. You told me not to say it was His Excellency the Baron. She was going there to take piano lessons. Baron Arity. This trial has become an outrage. Your title does not permit you to... I'll have you off this bench before you know it. You two gentlemen stay here. Thank you, my dear. You may go. Mr. Nemish, do you wish to sum up for the defense? Yes, thank you. There are people living among us today who seem to belong in the dark ages. Men whose ambition to rise in the world is so great they'll shirk at nothing. They'll forge testimonies, torture witnesses to perjury. They'll connive, lie, practice deceit even in its foulest form. Here, the greatest sin of all was committed. The youth of 14, who falsely accused his own people of a gruesome murder and gave it every appearance of truth. A bewildered child betrayed into thinking he was saving his father. This trial began against five innocent men. It should end with the arrest of those who hatched this plot. I shall not ask the court for the acquittal of these defendants, for to do so would be to insult your honors. But, gentlemen, this much I must say. Nothing you can do for them now would compensate or console them for the miseries and horrors they've been subjected to. That is all. In the name of His Apostolic Majesty, the King of Hungary, this court pronounces the five defendants acquitted of all charges. The case against them dismissed. They're free to leave at any time. Court adjourned. The Baron's scheme was exposed. But just as he was about to be tried by the Superior Hungarian Court, he was found dead as the result of a stroke.
I came to America, and Nemish went on to become the greatest attorney of his day. Strange. Very strange. It is that. But what became of the boy? Was that boy George? Yes. His real name was Samuel Schwartz. He repented for his lie so deeply that he never spoke a word since the last day of that trial. Until this, his dying day. <laughs> <laughs>